with Hashem's loving grace. This is Laser Brody with the Muna Hour from the Holy Land of Israel. Today's lesson addresses the question of Ishtadlis, the effort that each person is required to invest in order to make a living. Ishtadlis is the Hebrew word for effort, just like Emuna is the Hebrew word for faith. And because of their spiritual richness, we prefer to use the Hebrew word to teach it to everyone. Ishtadlis is the word for effort. So a classic rule of thumb says that the greater a person's bitochen, his trust in Hashem, the less the hishtadlis. In other words, the more a person trusts in Hashem and truly believes that Hashem is the provider, the less he or she needs to work. Now the opposite is even more obvious. For the more a person goes to great lengths to amass an income to make money, the less he or she trusts in Hashem because they believe that were it not for their efforts, they'd starve. So some people don't work enough and other people work too much. So excessive or insufficient hishtadlis is the result of a person's mistaken self-assessment, and he or she doesn't know their true place along the continuum if we have one side that is absolutely no bitochen, and another side that's full bitochen, that how much hishtadlis, how much effort they have to make uh, along that, that area. They, so it's it difficult for anyone to assess himself or herself and as far as their level of bitochen. But once we are familiar with our level of bitochen, we could discover a happy medium between bitochen and ishtadlis. So this is what we're going to try to do. We're going to try and find tonight the best way we can assess our bitochen and apply this to the amount of work we do. So we're going to learn the different systems of ishtadlis. All right. So a lot of people that they fool themselves and they don't do enough work. They suffer marital problems, they suffer income problems, and even emotional problems because they make a mistake. They wrongly assess themselves. Either they don't work enough because they think oh, they're at a high level of bitochan, which is not true, and they really need to do more work than what they do, or they do too much work and they do too much work, then their family suffers, their children suffers. So everyone needs to do what is necessary to make a living, but more toil than necessary, it's counterproductive to be tochen. It's counterproductive to make a living. So where do we learn this all from? We learned this from the lesson of the mana. The mana was one of the miraculous, this was the miraculous food substance that Hashem fed the children of Israel when they came out of Egypt for the 40 years that they sojourned in the desert. In the Sinai desert, there wasn't food to feed 2 million people. Hashem sent the mana, the heaven sent bread. And we read all about this in Exodus chapter 16. So the first time that the mana descended from the sky, they saw these particles that were like particles of, of honey bread, particles of a honeydew, and they didn't know what, they, what this was. And they said, man who? They asked in the local jargon, man who? The Torah says, man who? What's that? Man who? You spell it mem, nun, hey, vav, aleph. If we play Hebrew Scrabble, the letters, man who? What's that? What's, what's my parnasa? There's the words of emuna. So we learn intrinsically that a person's parnasa becomes from his level of emuna. And a person's bitochan is a level of emuna when applied to practical financial matters. So the Torah is conveying that our sustenance comes from the Almighty above and not from our toil below. So the mana, it teaches a few great lessons in bitochan. Every person would receive a daily allotment. This allotment was called an omer. An omer is equivalent to about 43 British ounces or maybe two and a third kilos. And it's enough for a person's substance for an entire day. This was sent out from heaven. Here is your food for today. Come back tomorrow for more. So we learn from the mana that Hashem gives us what we need for every day for a day. You open your hand and sustain every little thing. Okay, so the Israelites in the desert had to go gather their mana every day. In other words, they were given mana that they could hoard, and they were not allowed to hoard it. So people say, why does Hashem make them go to the effort every day? This is, well, there's one creature that doesn't have to make an effort. This is the snake. Hashem gives a snake all it needs when it needs. But a snake is far away from Hashem, and Hashem doesn't want the snake to be close to him. But Hashem loves us. And it wants us to be close to him, wants us all the time to look forward to him for our income. So it's something that gives it what we need for the, for the particular day. So, so what happens if we get every day, what happens on Shabbat? Some people would try and go and gather money on Shabbat. 
No, you're not supposed to work on Shabbat. You're not supposed to gather the man on Shabbat. So what Hashem would do on Friday, Hashem would grant a double portion. Okay, a double portion. If someone during the week tried to get more than he deserved, a double portion, the next day, the excess would become unfit for consumption, become full of worms, be spoiled. But the miraculous thing on Shabbat, that the second portion that was gathered on Friday was perfectly fresh and wholesome on Shabbat to provide Perzidka for Shabbat. So these are lessons of Bitochan that we learned from the Mana, and this chronologically was 3,330 years ago. But these lessons still apply today. They still apply today. Like we said, King David says in Psalm 145, Hashem, you open your hand and you stain every little thing. Okay, now then Siva Velozhin, the Nesiva Velozhin, Rabbi Naftali Tzviyu de Berlin, he lived between 1816 and 1893, he writes that anyone that violates the Shabbat in gathering income, going to work, learn this from the mana, is someone that shows that in addition to, uh, to breaking the Shabbat and going against Torah, it's a gross lack of a moon and bitochen. Okay, now the Zohar goes a step further. The Zohar says not only do you not need to work on Shabbat, but by resting on Shabbat and observing the sanctity of Shabbat, a person creates a spiritual field of blessing, a spiritual blessing that influences the entire week. And so a person's weekday blessing really comes from the Shabbat. That Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday give blessing, to get their blessing from last Shabbat, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday get their blessing from the Shabbat to come, this words of the Zohar. <clears throat> so we see that the divine mechanism of providing an income is basically the same today as it was 3,300 years ago in the time of the mana. The difference today is that it's concealed. Back then, it was complete revealed miracles, but now it's concealed. Really, inherently, intrinsically, we are still eating out of Hashem's hand, we're eating mana but Hashem is revealing it. And this is clothed in our work, but we don't work for income. We work because of whatever contribution we have to make to society, make them go better. So let's summarize the two practical lessons of the mana. Number one, we receive our sustenance from above, same for the mana, same for right now. And number two, that observing the Sabbath doesn't cause a decrease in income. Indeed, it's an increase. It makes a blessing to income. These are two lessons of the mana. So we, as we continue to learn our third lesson of the mana, third lesson of the mana teaches us three levels of bitochen. If we open up our Gemara to tractate Yuma, page 75a, the Gemara describes three groups of people pertaining to the way they receive the man. The first group of people were the people with a perfect bitochen, and they would receive the mana on their doorstep. The second people were people with a moderate level of bitochen, they would have to go maybe walk a mile or two to the edge of the camp and to gather their mana. But the third people had no bitochen and they had to walk miles and miles and miles and toil deep into the desert to gather their daily portion. So we see these three groups of people that the more bitochen they had, the less they needed to work. And it's simple, they were expected to have a high level bitochen because remember, this was the same generation that saw the splitting of the Red Sea. This was the same generation that saw the miracle of the 10 plagues in Egypt. So they were expected to have a trust. So those that didn't have trust in Hashem, they had to work hard. Okay, you deserve, you don't trust in Hashem, go, go work. All right. So the third lesson, as we see these three levels of Bitochan, it applies today as it did 40 years, as it did during the, the, the sojourning of the Israelites in the desert. But while we observe the characteristic of each group, we substitute the word income for the word mana. If we substitute the word income for the word mana, then lo and behold, we have three levels of people that receive their income, or more concisely, three levels of bitochen, people with a lot of bitochen, people with medium bitochen, people with little bitochen, okay? But each level of bitochon corresponds to a different level of ishtadlis. Now, in the above mentioned Gomorrah's description, we assume, we assume that bitochon and our efforts, our ishtadlis, 
are inversely proportionate. Because we understand from the Gemara that the more a person trusts in Hashem, the less a person needs to work. And the less a person trusts in Hashem, the more he needs to work. Okay. Uh, so some of our sages disagree with the assumptions we're going to see. All right. Now, there are differences today because that back then was a generation that saw the miracles in Egypt. Today it's different. Hashem's concealed. But there are three groups of our sages, your opinions, where instead of talking about the level of bitochon, because it's difficult for us to assess our own level of bitochon, it's difficult for a person to honestly assess himself. But what do we do know? We do know how much we work. We know if we work four hours a day, or six hours a day, or eight hours a day, 12 hours a day. This we know. We know our level of hishtadlis. So our sages talk about three systems in hishtadlis, and by the type of effort we do, the type of hishtadlis we do, this not only reveals our current level of bitochon, but this gives us a starting point to enhance our bitochon. Okay, now according to our sages, there are proponents, a priori proponents on each level, that the three levels that correspond to the three levels of bitochon, where there was people with perfect bitochon, people with immediate bitochon, and people with complete bitochon, uh, our sages talk about three levels of ishtadlis. Three levels of ishtadlis where people do absolutely no work. It's first level. The second level, people do a minimal level of work for it to amass their income. The rest, they trust Hashem. And the third level where people work very, very hard. Okay, so instead of talking about uh, the bitochan, a level of bitochan is a bit problematic because the majority of people, like we said, can't, objectively upset, upset, uh, assess themselves, and those who think they can, they often make mistakes. You take, for example, people that are new to Torah, and they're enthusiastic, and they say, oh, what be talking? It's a guy leaves his job, and he's going to go in his shiv and learn all day long. No, don't do that. Uh, I, young men that are connected to me, I don't let them do that, because in order to learn all day long, you have to have strong be talking to back it up, because if you don't have it strong to back it up, then you're if no backup, then there's crack up. Okay, the person, what happens is when he all of a sudden sees he's learning Torah, but doesn't get his income. Hashem, how come you not send me income? Because you young men don't have sufficient, you have sufficiently built your bitochen muscles. All right. So in the three systems of Ishtadlis, we're going to talk about, these are three general categories. Our sages call them systems. And each one of them has proof in the Torah. Each of the sages and each of the three groups they give proof to back up their system. So system one is where a person does no ishtadlis at all. Okay, he's got perfect, he's got no ishtadlis at all. Where do we learn this from? And who are the proponents of this system? This is the level of those people that think that Hashem will provide for them with no effort on their part in making a living. Okay, this does not mean that they'll be idle. And it doesn't mean that they'll pursue mundane uh, pursuits. In other words, you can't play golf all day long and say, Hashem, provide for me. You can't sit in front of a TV all day long and say, Hashem, provide for me. A person can learn Torah all day long. And if his bitochen, his amun is strong enough and he's fervent enough and he learns diligently enough, he can't expect that Hashem provide him because this is a promise in the Torah. Uh, there's a commandment in Torah. First chapter of Joshua, eighth verse, you shall learn Torah day and night, and the words of Torah shall not leave your mouth. Okay, so it sounds like Hashem is commanding us that we don't budge from Torah. And anytime we leave our learning of Torah, the Gemara says, the Gemara, that the, the soldiers and Gemara that back this up, they say, when are you allowed to refrain from learning Torah? When it's neither day nor night, because Joshua was commanded to learn Torah day and night. So if you could find a time when it's neither day or night, then you don't have to learn, right? And then there's another promise in the Torah. It says, and what we say in Vayayim Shema, in the second passage of Shema, uh, if you diligently heed my, my commandments, You'll gather your grain, your wine, your oil, 
In other words, Vayayim Shemuel Mitzvoisai, Asher Noah Mitzvayas Chamiyom, if you heed my command, Mitzvah Safta Dinav Sirosh HaMitzvacha, and you shall gather your grain, you'll gather your wine, you'll gather your olive oil, everything you need for your sustenance. Okay, so the inherent necessity, the prerequisite of this level is a person's dedicated commitment to learning round the clock Torah. If a person is not dedicated to learn round the clock Torah, then don't try and enter the fraternity of those that do no ishtadlis, okay? The system of no ishtadlis, okay? Uninterrupted Torah study, this is what's required, okay? The only time they're allowed to take a break is for basic bodily functions, to eat a meal, to go to the bathroom, to, to sleep, and even then a minimum. It's not a license to sleep 10 hours a day that the Torah scholars, they sleep very little, they just spend all their, their time, they, they sleep whatever they need to, to refresh their brain. Now, the prophet that was the proponent of this system of no hishtadlis, that was Jeremiah the prophet. Jeremiah the prophet, the Midrash tells us, they chastise the people for not learning Torah enough and for just running after their income. And he went into the Holy of Holies in the base of Migdash that were, where a jar of manna was stored with the tablets of the law, with the Ten Commandments, ever since the time of Moses, and since the ten, in second tablets. And he took that jar and he showed the people and he said, you know how your ancestors ate in the desert? This is what they ate. And Hashem could feed you this way too. So you have to learn Torah. So what he was saying, this is the words of Jeremiah the prophet, that the laws of the manna, he was showing the manna, but there was not manna. Hashem wasn't sending them, them down manna uh, during the time of Jeremiah in the first temple. But he was showing them that the laws, the intrinsic law that Hashem provides us of our income, that this was applicable, applicable just as much in, in his time as it was in the time of the exodus of Egypt. Okay, so Jeremiah is the, pro, he's the proponent of this. The Gemara mentions this system, and the proponent of the system in the Gemara is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai looked at people that are plowing and working the field all day long, and he says, you're working the field all day long? What's going to be with the Torah? What's going to be with the Torah? He said, you should stop and, and learn Torah. And the latter-day proponents of this system are the Vilna Gaon and the the altar of Nidvarnik. Right? So that person doesn't need to do, as long as he's doing dedicated Torah study, does not need to do any work at all. Just sit and learn Torah, this is commanded. Okay, this is our first system. Our second system says, no, a person must do effort, ishtadlis, but a minimal amount of effort. This is the system that most of our sages hold by, that a uh, minority of our sages hold by the first system, no ishtadlis. The second system, most of our sages hold by this. And the Gemara mentions that Rebbe Yishmoel, Rebbe Shimon Bar Yochai's contemporary and colleague, they often argue all through the Gemara. Okay, but he, they, Rebbe Yishmoel says, no, you have to do a little bit of ishtadlis. The Gemara says at that particular place, this Gemara in Tractate Brachas, 35 a, it's that many people did according to Rabbi Shemba Yochai, they didn't succeed. And many people adopted Rabbi Shmoel's system of minimal ishtadlis, and they did succeed. They, they made a living and learned Torah. Now, in the Mishnah, we see this in the Ethics of the Fathers, Tractate Ovis, second chapter, second Mishnah, Rabbi Gamliel. This was Rabbi Gamliel's because Rabbi Gamliel says, beautiful is the, story, the beautiful is the study of Torah with worldly endeavor. Worldly endeavor means work. And then he says that all Torah study, it's Rabbi Gamliel, all Torah study that's not accompanied with work is destined to become null and void and to cause sin. Because a person might, uh, if he's not on that perfect level, who has complete trust in Hashem, then he might do some monkey business and trying to gather income, and it's going to cause sin. So who else? This is King David's system. In King David's younger years, King David didn't sit in the Torah study all, all day long. King David was out tending sheep. But even though King David was tending sheep, his mind was in Torah, his mouth was in, in prayer and Torah. Okay, King David, what does he say in Psalm 28? 
Yegea kapecha ki tochol, ashrecha v'tov lach. When you eat the fruits of your labor, your life is good, you're happy. It's words of King David, the fruits of your labor. It's like he's saying to do some labor, do some work. Okay, but in 119, Psalm 119, verse 97, King David says, Ma hafti toratecha, how I love your Torah, Hashem. It's on my lips the entire day. So even though a person is doing some work, his heart, his brain is with Hashem in the Torah. This is also the system of the Chavis Levavos, Rabbi Rabbeinu Bachia Ibn Pekuda. Don't confuse him with Rabbeinu Bachia Ben Asher. Rabbeinu Bachia Ben Asher wrote Rabbeinu Bachia on the Torah. The author of Chavis Levavos, Duties of the Heart, this is Rabbeinu Bachia Ibn Pekuda. Two of our Rishonim, they're both named Rabbeinu Bachia, but one was the son of Ibn Pekuda and the other was the son of Asher. Rabbeinu Bachia, he says that a person should do minimishtadlis, but any excess in the minimishtadlis is a blemish in a modern bitochen. Also holds by this sita, many people think that the Alsheikh and Reb Chaim Veloshner, who was a Talmud, who was a student of the Gra, the Gona of Vilna, hold like the Gona of Vilna, that no ishtadlis. But they clarify the, the system of no ishtadlis. They say this is for a select few. Both the Al Sheikh and Reb Chaim of Lozhin, they say that the Masa people, normal people should try and strive to reduce their ishtadlis and raise their Torah time by reducing the learning time. We're going to talk about that ne next week's lesson. Okay. Uh, the Ramchal is also a proponent of the system. And this really, this immediate level of minimum shadless, this is the level that we have to set our eyes on. But now there's a third system, and third system that most of us are involved in today. This is the system of fully shadless. And the system of fully shadless, also anchored in the Torah, also proof in Torah, that says since this, what's the ideology behind the system? Is that since we live in the physical world, and since we are occupied in the world of nature, uh, there's, we can't rely on miracles. And we have to do whatever we need to do in effort to make a living. Okay. And they quote the Torah in Bracious Gibble, Genesis chapter 3, that says, by the sweat of your brow, you'll make a living. So the curse, Adam was cursed after he sinned. So Shep says, uh, you're going to make a living by the sweat of your brow. Literally, Torah says, Bezata pecha, that's the sweat of your face. But we quote that this sweat of your brow. Okay. But King Solomon, King David's son, he also adheres to this. King Solomon says a very interesting proverb. Now, King Solomon, there are entire volumes of what King Solomon says in one proverb. If we open up chapter 21 of Proverbs and we look at verse 31, King Solomon says something very small and very weighty, very significant. He says, the horse is prepared for battle, but victory is up to Hashem. Sus muhan milchama, but Hashem atshua. This is what he says. So what does it mean the horse is prepared for battle? Last week we explained that the horse today, it's a tank, it's an airplane. When a soldier goes into battle, he has to make sure that that airplane is well equipped, that it's uh, well it's maintained that there's no breakdown he has to make sure that his own personal weapon it's crystal clear it's clean it's well lubricated so that it doesn't jam make sure that the parts are, are working and tested before going into battle because a nightmare is to have that not function in battle and when people don't check it they're there would they check their equipment properly this a, a, a lot of fatalities are because of Slipshot equipment. So King Solomon says, no, you got to do your thing. That horse has to be ready for battle. That tank has to be ready for battle. You young man, you Mr. Soldier, you have to be in top physical shape. You can't go around smoking. You can't go around uh, eating junk food because what you're doing, it's, 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 it's disloyal to the army. It's disloyal to your unit. It's disloyal to the whole country. You got to keep, stop, top yourself, top shape, top shape, top physical shape. That is King Solomon's was it admonishing us, have that horse ready for battle. Have yourself ready for battle. Okay, by the same token, how does a merchant apply this? Uh, merchant has to make sure that the store, that the shelves are well stocked, stocked that it's well light, it's appealing to come in there. 
it, it, it's clean. Uh, no one wants to go into a dirty store. No one wants to go to a store with it's a lack stock and dusty shelves and old stuff. Nobody likes that. It's got to do his effort. Any person, whatever job is doing, has to do the effort. In other words, you make the effort, but then la shema chua, the victory, salvation, this comes from Hashem. Okay. But now there's a second group that engage in full hishtadlis, but they're different. The first group I call the believers. The first group, they're the ones that they work full time, but they know they have to do their effort. But winning the war doesn't depend on them. It depends on Hashem. And they go and they open up the store, they do best job, but the money they make, that depends on Hashem. There's a second group that also works all day long. And these are the people that don't believe in Hashem, that don't believe in Amunah, don't believe in Bitochan. Now, there's some people that look like they're religious and look like maybe they've got long black coats or long beards or whatever. And if they do dishonest business, that means they don't believe in Hashem because Hashem says you must do honest business. And just we're talking Emunah and Bitochan, it's just as much applicable to our non-Jewish brothers and sisters, they are to our Jewish brothers and sisters, because Emunah applies to all of humanity. And one of the Noahide laws is you can't steal. And people that steal in business are those that don't believe in Hashem. So the difference between the believers and the non-believers, they're both working all day long. But the believer, he'll never work on Shabbat. She'll never work on Shabbat. She'll never say something bad about uh, a customer, about a competitor. Heaven forbid. She goes according to Chofetz Chaim, goes according to the laws of commerce. And a non-believer, a non-believer says, oh, fair and love and war, and it, make it living as a war. We're now 21st century, we're 21st century gladiators, so I got to do whatever I can to defeat my computer, my competitor, or, and to take advantage and make money from my customers or whatever. Not only that, but they might not pay the workers on time, they'll shortchange salaries, they will violate Torah right and left. So that's the difference, even in the group that works all day long, okay, and there are sages that say this is acceptable, but it's acceptable according to the Torah. So with this in mind, when a person engages in all day long ishtadlis, what he needs to do is to strengthen his amuna and bitochan to be sure that ishtadlis is kosher, it's according to Torah. And that he observes the laws of Torah, he or she observes the law of Torah while doing what they must do to make a living. And this is the bare minimum that's demanded for us, that if we're working all day long, at least do it according to the statutes of Torah. Next week, Bezrat Hashem, we're going to learn about how to make a better living in less time. And we're going to continue learning about Ishtadlis, about effort. Meanwhile, let's just have a wonderful, wonderful week and all the income, worry-free, anxiety-free income. And it's also great for your health because when you have anxiety-free income, there's less heart to heart attacks and there's less ulcers and less gastro and nerve problems and everything. Bo Hashem. Bo Hashem. Shev, all your heart's wishes for the best and a wonderful week. And we look forward to seeing you next week on Amuna Hour. God bless.